Hey friends and welcome. My name is Michael and uh, I'm glad you're joining us today. Uh, Pastor Nate is coming with a message and it is an outstanding word. I'm excited to hear it together. Uh, and then want to remind you to stick around after. Uh, Jenny and I are going to be chatting with Pastor Nate uh, about the message and we're going to dig in a little deeper. It's going to be great. As always, friends, if you want to learn more about Christ Community, you can check out our app, check us out online. Um, and we would love to be a part of or answer any questions that you may have. Um, so without further ado, let's dig right into the message today. Well, hey there, Christ Community. Uh, my name is, is Nate Davis. I'm one of the pastors here. And before we dive into what we have for our time together today, I want to I wanna update you on some changes that are happening in my life and in my role here at Christ Community. So I don't know if any of you had a chance to read the church email that went out a couple weeks ago. Uh, if you scrolled all the way to the bottom, you would have seen that we have a listing for uh, a new student and college pastor. Now, there's some of you who might be a little bit confused by that because for the last four years, that, that's been my job. And so I wanted to update you on what's happening there. So first of all, I'm not leaving the church. I love Christ community. My family loves Christ community. This place is home. You would literally have to drag us out of here kicking and screaming, right? I'm, I'm not going anywhere. But after 17 years in student ministry, I am transitioning out of my role in student ministry into a new role here at the church. Now, I want you to know the student ministry is in great hands. Uh, Pastor Stetson's actually moving into a new role to be over all of next gen, which in my opinion is just like one of the greatest things ever. We're gonna be hiring a new person to come and work with Stetson. So on that front, everything is great. Young people are gonna continue to be impacted in a positive way. The student ministry will continue to thrive. All right, but as for me, starting in July, I'm moving into a new pos position, a, a position called the Directional Pastor of Outreach, and I'll be focused on leading all of our local and global initiatives here as a church. Uh, and specifically, a lot of my time and energy is gonna be spent on creating pathways and strategies that'll empower you and all of us as a church to live missionally here in Greeley so that we might see more of a kingdom impact in our, our schools, in our neighborhoods, and in our workplaces. All right, so all that to say, if you have a heartbeat for that, or, or if you've always had ideas of things we could be doing or things we should be doing, uh, shoot me an email. I would love to sit down with you and talk about it. All right, so that's uh, enough announcements, but I, I'd be remiss if we didn't at least talk about that. Uh, but as I, as I mentioned a, a couple moments ago, I, I've been in student ministry now for 17 years. And over the course of these 17 years, I've gotten to have a lot of conversations with a lot of different types of people about a lot of different issues. And because people know that I'm a pastor, a lot of times when people come up to talk to me, it's usually because there's something wrong in their life that they need help with. Or other times it's because there's this thing that they're wrestling with that they can't make sense of that they're looking for clarity on. And so for me over the past month, as I've been preparing for this coming transition, I've found myself thinking about a lot of these conversations I've had over the years. And because I'm a little analytical, uh, maybe a little too analytical at times if you uh, ask my wife, but, but because I'm analytical, I've been trying to identify like a, like a singular thread that ties all of these things together. Right, a singular thing that's driving people to either solve a problem or find an answer. And I think I've landed on an answer that makes sense to me. You see, I really think that the thing that's driving 99% of the questions or issues that people are wrestling with in their lives is this, is that they're searching for something, right? Some would call it happiness. Others would call it purpose. Some might even call it meaning. And they spend all of their energy chasing after this thing. They dedicate themselves to it. They spend inordinate amounts of money trying to possess it, countless hours trying to, to master it. They sacrifice friendships, they sacrifice family. And then when they get this thing, right? This thing that they were convinced would give them happiness, purpose, and meaning. This thing that they thought would make them whole. This thing that they thought would help them experience life. Well, it comes up empty. And that's typically when they reach out for help. They know that they want something. They, they know that they're missing something, but they don't know how to get it. Now, can you relate to that? 
Have you ever felt like there was something missing in your life? Something missing in your relationship with Jesus? Right? Maybe you see other people in your life who experience this deep joy. They've got this deep conviction in who God is. They have such a trust in him, such intimacy with him. And meanwhile, you're doing everything that you think you need to be doing, everything that you should be doing, right? You're going to church, you're reading your Bible, you're trying to pray, you give, you serve, but you're just not quite there yet. What do we do in those moments? Well, that's what we're gonna be talking about today as we look to Jesus. All right, so we're in this series right now in the Gospel of John. And by the way, if you haven't got a chance to hear any of the messages in the series up to this point, I wanna encourage you at some point in the next few weeks, go, go back and listen to them. You, you can do that on the app. You can do that on, on YouTube. And the reason I'm asking you to do this is because I really believe uh, that, that everything we've covered so far, everything we've covered before today is absolutely essential for us to understand if we're gonna really kind of capture this broad picture that the author of John is painting for us of who Jesus is and why he's worth paying attention to, of why he's worth giving our lives to. All right, so this last week, uh, Mariana did just such a fantastic job of walking through the last part of John 2, all right? And in there, what we see is we see Jesus confronting the religious leaders in the temple over some things that were happening that, that he wasn't okay with, all right? And in this moment of confrontation, Jesus got angry. He flipped some tables. He drove the money changers out. Now, as you can imagine, when a thing like that happens, Right When a respected teacher and leader appears to lose his cool, people talk about it, right? The news gets out. Um, you remember how big the, the Will Smith slapping Chris Rock thing was a couple months ago at the Oscars? Yeah, th this was that moment in that time. Overnight, the entire region was talking about it. It was a really big deal. And as you can imagine, the religious leaders, they weren't all that happy about what happened because they had been called out. And in John's narrative, that's actually when they began to plot against him. And so our story today picks up right after this. It's in chapter three. And what we see in verse one is that one of the religious leaders who was there earlier that day was so intrigued by what he saw that he just had to come and talk to Jesus. All right, this is how it begins in verse one. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night. All right, so here we're introduced to Nicodemus. He's a, a, a Pharisee, a religious leader, and he's coming to Jesus under the cover of darkness to talk to him. Now, whenever I've heard this passage taught on before, a lot of times I've been told that Jesus uh, was approached by Nicodemus at night because Nicodemus was afraid that the other religious leaders were going to judge him for talking to Jesus. Because, well, as, as you know, Jesus, he was seen to be their enemy. Right, I've been taught that Nicodemus was afraid of being lumped in as a follower of Jesus and losing his status in the temple on the ruling council. And so to keep all of this off of their radar, he went at night when nobody would see him when he knew he'd be safe. Now, all of that could be true, right? It, it definitely could be true because it's possible, but I don't think that's why John includes this particular detail about the time of day in here. You see, I think John is actually cluing us into something really important about this interaction that's about to happen between Jesus and Nicodemus. And that's because all throughout this particular gospel, there are these two images that John uses to contrast the present reality with the coming reality, to contrast the way things are with the way things should be and will be. And those two images are darkness and light. Now, the image of darkness for John, it, it's meant to represent the, the way of the world, right? The, the, the way of no hope, the way of being lost, of, of death. Whereas the image of light, that's the way of the kingdom. That's the way of hope. That's the way of being found. That is the way of life. And so right off the bat, we're, we're clued into what's happening here. By using these words, by using these images, we know what John is trying to tell us. We've got this guy, right? Nicodemus, a religious leader who is living in darkness without hope, who is coming out of that to the one true source of light, the one true source of hope. 
And that's Jesus. And with this story coming right on the heels of everything that just happened in the temple, we can make a logical guess that this story is really just a continuation of that story. That everything we see here is really about contrasting this old religious system and the order and everything that goes along with that, with this new thing that Jesus is doing. Oh, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he says this, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Right, so, so Nicodemus, he had seen everything that Jesus had done earlier that day. He, he had probably heard all the stories about Jesus from the people who were there. He, he knew the Old Testament, right? He knew everything that had been written about the Messiah of the signs that he could perform. And, and Nicodemus, this, this was not a dumb guy, right? It appears that he was starting to put things together. E- even though many of the other religious leaders had an issue with Jesus, Nicodemus couldn't deny what he was seeing because nobody could do the things that Jesus was doing if God wasn't with him. And so he comes to Jesus and he calls him rabbi, which means teacher, right? This is a sign of respect and honor. And then he makes his statement. Now, what's interesting to me is that there's no obvious question here for Jesus. It's just like this matter of fact statement. But, but it almost feels like there's this thing he's not saying. Like there's this question that he really wants to ask Jesus because you don't typically seek somebody out like this in the middle of the night just to say something to them and then to walk away. And it seems like Jesus knew this. And we see that in his response to Nicodemus where he appears to answer this question that Nicodemus was wanting to ask all along. In verse three, it says this, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. All right, so it does kind of seem like Jesus here is answering that unspoken question that Nicodemus was asking in his own heart, right? We we know that Nicodemus could see that God was with Jesus. And it seems like the thing Nicodemus really wanted to know is this, is the kingdom coming? right? Is this thing that we're hoping for, like, is this really about to happen in Jesus? How do I experience it? Now, just some background on that phrase, kingdom of God. It's actually a a pretty loaded phrase. You see, for the Jewish people, this evoked the idea of a literal, physical, military, governmental reign of God here on earth. It would be a time when God would literally come and rebuild Israel and establish himself as a monarch over it. And for the Jewish people at this time, that that was a really big deal because remember, they were being occupied by the Roman Empire. That they weren't free. And this new kingdom, it represented everything they wanted, everything they were yearning for. All right, now there's a lot of rabbit trails we could go down with kingdom theology that we don't have time with uh, time for today. But to sum it up, the kingdom was this hoped for reality when everything that God had promised his people all throughout the scriptures would finally be accomplished. It was the thing that they were longing for. And, and so Nicodemus, when he comes to Jesus, he wants to know, is it here? How do I see it? And how do I experience it? And so Jesus tells him, he says, the only way you can see the kingdom, the only way you get to experience this thing, it's by being born again. Now, now in our culture, we understand what that phrase means, right? Because of what John has written here, that phrase being born again, it's kind of become synonymous with this idea of converting to Christianity with beginning a relationship with Jesus. But back then, nobody had ever heard it before. I thought it would have been a very confusing phrase, which is exactly what we see in Nicodemus' response. He, he wasn't understanding what Jesus meant. And we see that in verse four. He says, how can someone be born again when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their, their mother's womb to be born. Right? Obviously, Nicodemus, he's, he's missing the point. And so Jesus continues on in verse five. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water, in the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. 
You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. All right, so what Jesus says here, I mean, we could literally spend weeks unpacking this because there is so much rich theology here. Right, first there's this whole idea of the kingdom of God, which we just talked a little bit about. And then there's what Jesus says about being born of water and spirit, which for some has been interpreted as meaning that we need to be baptized to be saved. But but I don't think that's what Jesus is actually saying. You see, when you understand the Jewish story and where they'd come from, especially the imagery used in that culture, which is something we know John really likes to focus on, you would know that water, it's, it's a symbol of life. It's a symbol of cleansing, right? Water sprung from the rocks in the desert to revive the people of Israel when they were dying of thirst in the wilderness. Bathing in the waters of the Jordan cleansed Naaman who was a foreigner who had leprosy and gave him this new lease on life being fully healed, right? The imagery of water, it's all about saving life and experiencing new life. And and then we have that word spirit. In the Greek, this is the word pneuma. In Hebrew, it's the word ruach. And often in scripture, it's used to describe this new life that is breathed into people. And this actually harkens back to the creation story where God, after he had made Adam of the dust of the earth, picked him up and he breathed life into him. He breathed a spirit into him. Where there was nothing, there became something. And it was this breath, right? This ruach, this pneuma that came into Adam and made him new. And then we have what Jesus says about the wind, of how we don't understand it, but, but we experience it, of how we can't control it, but we can react to it. And here Jesus is using this to, to illustrate this new thing that God is doing. It wasn't a thing that could be controlled in the way that things in the past have been able to, but it was something that could be experienced as it began to come into this world. All right, so Jesus's use of these three words, right? You got water, spirit, wind. There's something that Nicodemus as a religious leader would have understood because they are packed with meaning, right? There was this new and unexpected thing happening, something that had never been done before. And it wasn't the thing that made sense, but Jesus is trying to point Nicodemus to this idea like, and, and just consider Nicodemus, right? He's a religious leader in a religious system who has this old way of doing things, right? And in this old way, the people were slaves. They were slaves to the law. They were slaves to the religious leaders. They were slaves to the religious system. But Jesus is saying, as that is going away, there is a new thing that God is doing. And those old ways, they're not gonna work anymore. They're not gonna produce the kind of life that you're looking for, Nicodemus. They're not gonna show you the kingdom. Now, this must have been a hard thing for Nicodemus to grasp. I mean, think about him for a second, right? He was immersed in this old system, in this Jewish way of living. He knew all 613 laws that were in the Torah and he obeyed them faithfully. He knew every single ritual. He probably obeyed every single holiday. In the eyes of the law, he was probably blameless. Nicodemus had grown up and been taught that the end all be all of a good life was to be a good Jew, to follow all of the rules, to do everything you were supposed to do. Because if you could do that, they taught, you would be set, you would be right with God. You would see the kingdom. You would experience life. Now, honestly, that doesn't sound too far off from the way many of us live today, does it? Maybe it's because of some of the messages we internalized because of experiences we've had in our faith journey. But maybe just like Nicodemus, right? We, we had a crazy conversion story, but now our, our relationship with Jesus, it's just a lot more routine. We go to church, we do our devos, we give, we serve, we do all that and we're gonna be fine. You know, for a lot of us, just like for Nicodemus, our relationship with God has been reduced to a list of tasks that we try to faithfully complete. And look, like when you're in the middle of it, you 
probably don't notice how lifeless that can feel at times. But have you ever had a moment of clarity where you're able to step back and see things as they are? I know I have, and in those moments, I begin to realize there's something missing. And that's what you have Jesus essentially saying here. Right, all, all these things that we do, they're, they're not enough. In fact, they, they were never enough. He's telling Nicodemus that if he wants that thing, he's always longed for, right? If he wants the kingdom, if he wants to experience life, to see God moving, there's this new thing that has to happen. There's a new life he has to be born into. And Nicodemus responds and says, how can this be? Right? He's still confused because what Jesus is saying is literally challenging everything he had been taught up to this point in his life. But honestly, I, I suspect that Nicodemus was here with Jesus that night because deep down, he knew that what Jesus was saying was true, right? Even, even if he couldn't understand it, he, he had done everything he could possibly do and he still probably felt empty. I mean, remember how this story was set up by John. Nicodemus was coming out of the dark and stepping into the light. And here Jesus is telling him there is a way to experience true life. But he's not quite getting it yet. Jesus responds to Nicodemus in verse 10. He says, you are Israel's teacher. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the, man must, the, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. All right, so here the, the conversation begins to shift a little bit because up until now, Jesus had just been explaining things. He had been answering questions, but here it seems like Jesus is kind of rebuking Nicodemus. And there's a reason for that, right? He's a religious leader. He is a man who understands the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, about this coming kingdom. He is somebody who objectively speaking should know these things that Jesus is saying better than most. And yet still, even with Jesus standing there right in front of him, saying the things he's saying, doing the things that he's doing, he's missing it. Jesus is there bringing the kingdom, doing kingdom things, and he's blind to it. Right? Nicodemus, just like all of the other rel religious leaders, they still thought that the temple, this religious system they had built, they thought that that was the way. But Jesus in this whole interaction is making the exact opposite point. The starting place for experiencing the kingdom, it's, it's not works, right? It's, it's not being a good enough person. It's not the things that we do. It actually begins with faith. Right? And to drive this point home, Jesus references this thing that happened when the Israelites were wandering um, out in the desert. Right, this is after God had delivered them from the Canaanites and, and the people, uh, they, they weren't too pleased with the way things were going. And so they began to, to complain. They, they began to grumble against God and Moses and to turn on them saying, this isn't what we signed up for. You can't really protect us. And, and so God, he, he became angry and he allowed these poisonous snakes to make their way into the camp and begin biting people, which led to many deaths. Now, the Israelites, when they realized what was going on, they repented and they sent Moses to God to pray for them, to beg for forgiveness. And God instructed Moses to make a bronze snake and to put it on a pole and to lift it high in the center of camp so that whenever somebody was bit by a snake, all they had to do was look up at this thing and they would be saved. They would be healed. Right? And it's in this act of having the faith to believe, which is then followed by the act of obedience of actually looking up at this snake that these people would be admitting, like, I can't save myself. Like I am unable, only God can do this. 
Right? It's, it's in that act that God stepped in, that, that God saved them. And then Jesus says that in the same way that happened with a physical sickness that led to death, he, the son of man, was here on this earth to be lifted up so that he could ultimately deal with mankind's spiritual sickness that leads to a spiritual death. Right? This is a foreshadow of the cross. This is what's coming at the end of the gospel of John. And Jesus says that when people look to him and when they believe, all right, so you believe, you have this obedient act of looking at Jesus, he says, that's, that's when you're gonna be saved. It's not through being obedient to the law. It's not through the religious system. You're gonna be saved by Jesus. He then goes on to say what's probably one of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. Something that reveals not only the heart of God, but also the heart of Christianity. And there in John three sixteen, he says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What Jesus says here is, is profound, right? In, in the Greco-Roman world, which many of the readers of this gospel were a part of, everybody thought that the gods were angry, right? They thought the gods only wanted to destroy humanity. And yet here, Jesus, who is God himself is saying, that's not the case. I'm not here to, to judge the world. I'm not here to condemn the world. In fact, I'm, I'm here to save the world. Why? Because I love the world. And I want everybody to experience eternal life. Jesus closes this interaction with Nicodemus by saying this, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Now, a lot of times when we look at this part of John, right, this whole interaction with Nicodemus. Uh, I think sometimes we're, we're prone to think that this is a passage that's mostly a, applicable to new believers. All right, with all this talk about new life and, and believing, we think it's for them. And, and there's some truth to that. But right here in this last statement that we just read, I think Jesus gets at the heart of what it means to be a follower of his. And what he says here is applicable to all of us. Right, being a follower of Jesus, it begins with belief. It, it does, right? We see Jesus. We recognize who he is. We're drawn to the light and that is so important. It really, really is. But faith doesn't stop there. It can't stop there. Being a follower of Jesus isn't just about this intellectual ascent to a certain idea that we did at a particular time of our life. It's not just agreeing with what the Bible says about Jesus. It's not about just a singular moment in time. It's about every moment in time that comes after. It's about a faith that literally changes the way we live. Jesus says that when we believe, we come into the light. All right, now coming into the light, this isn't just this one-time thing. We have to make this intentional effort to keep coming into the light day by day, to keep coming into his presence. And look, I get it. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that, that's scary because we follow Jesus, but we also still struggle with sin. And so sometimes because we're ashamed, we'd rather stay in the dark. Or, or sometimes we get into this religious routine like Nicodemus and the Pharisees, and it's just easier to keep doing the same things out of habit because walking in the light, that, that demands something of us. But if I could do this, that feels easier. But regardless of how hard it feels at times, Jesus invites us into the light because he knows the light is the only place where we can find all of those things that we're looking for. And so he tells us to come. 
right? To, to bring all those things that we're struggling with, to bring all those sins that we're ashamed of, to bring all of our flaws and our insecurities, to bring all of our hopes and all of our dreams, to bring all of this into the light, into the presence of Jesus and to be fully exposed before him. Because that's what light does, right? It drives darkness away so that we can actually see things as they are. But here's the promise he makes us both here and elsewhere of what happens when we do this, right? When we come into the light, he tells us that he'll meet us there. And when he meets us with all of these things that we're bringing, this is when we get to experience firsthand the power of the kingdom of God as it manifests itself in our lives through things like love and grace and mercy and compassion and acceptance, right? Seeing the light and believing that this is where life begins. But faithfully walking in the light, that's how it continues. I wanna close by reading a quote from C.S. Lewis that I've just absolutely loved over the years. And I think it perfectly captures the heartbeat of what Jesus says in this interaction in such a beautiful and poetic way as he talks about finding everything we're looking for in Jesus. This is what he says. He says, your real new self will not come as long as you're looking for it. It will come when you're looking for him. Does that sound strange? The same principle holds, you know, for more everyday matters, even in social life. You will never make a good impression on other people until you stop thinking about what sort of impression you're making. Even in literature and art, no man who bothers about originality will ever be original. Whereas if you simply try to tell the truth, you will nine times out of 10 become original without ever having noticed it. The principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep nothing back. Nothing that you have not given away will be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay but look for Christ and you will find him and with him, everything else thrown in. Let's pray. So as we do uh, after every message, we wanna give you an opportunity to respond because we believe the Holy Spirit is here and he is speaking and he is showing us things. And so there's two types of responses I want to invite you to walk through. The first one is this. If if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, maybe, maybe you've been like Nicodemus. You're living in darkness. You've never turned to Jesus. And maybe for the first time, while you're listening to this, you're hearing that God loves you. And right now in this moment, you're being drawn to the light, being drawn to truth. Friend, know this, God loves you and he wants you and he is inviting you into a relationship with him. And for this relationship that there are no prerequisites, Jesus said, all you have to do is believe and you will be saved. And so if that's you, I wanna create a space here for just a moment to invite you to invite Jesus into your life by praying a prayer. And it's a, it's a simple prayer. But if this is you in your own heart, look to Jesus and, and say these things to him. Lord, I know I'm lost without you. I know my sin separates me from you. But I also know that you love me and that you came into this world to go to the cross and die in my place, all so that I could be saved. 
And so I confess my sin to you. I confess my need for you. And I ask that you come into my life to be my Lord, to be my savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. And the second response is this. There are many of us who have that relationship with Jesus. We have chosen to believe and to come to him. But we also have to admit that sometimes just because of the chaos of life, it's easy to take our eyes off of him and to step out of the light and instead rely on ourselves instead of trusting him. And so I wanna give you just a few moments to, to ask the spirit a few questions and see what he says to you. But ask him, am I walking in the light right now? Or am I living in the darkness? Are there things that I need to confess? Are there things that I need to surrender? Ask the spirit these things and respond how he leads. Jesus, you are the light of the world. And even when we were in darkness, you came here because you loved us and you had a desire to see us be saved. Would you overwhelm each and every one of us with that truth and help us see the beauty of what that truly means? Lord, we don't wanna continue doing the things that we've always done, thinking we're gonna get different results. We wanna live the life that you've called us to. We wanna experience the joy and the hope and the life that you want for us. And so would you give us the courage every day when we wake up, every moment we're awake to flee the darkness and to step into the light, to not let our faith be something that's just about this commitment we made all those years ago, but instead to let it be about a commitment we are making day by day and moment by moment to choose you, to trust you and to place our hope in you. Jesus, would we get lost in you and would we experience life with you? I pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hey. joining us. Michael and I are here to chat with That Nate. guy. <laughs> with yeah. Nate. What guy? This guy right here. I'm so. a guy? <laughs> <laughs> hey, first of all, thank you for talking about your transition at the beginning. Yes. Letting people know. I think that's really cool. How are you feeling about that? I'm so excited. Yeah. Like, I, I had a few people come up and ask me, like, are you leaving the church? Because we hadn't made <laughs> right. the announcement yet. And it was like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying I'm going yeah. into a new role. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully it cleared up any confusion. But like, I'm really excited. Like yeah. I get to do uh, essentially everything I've been doing with students reaching into that culture. And now we get to do it more broad. Right. So now I think you're the perfect person for it. I know. So it's, it's excited. honestly, it's probably about like 10 times the amount of work. <laughs> <laughs> give, or, give or take, you know, a ton. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's so cool because it's, it's like Phil had done some of that stuff. Right. So it's like you do everything, but you're responsible for nothing. So yeah. it's like this super ambiguous, but we'll, we're going we're gonna to do some cool things. So if you want to be a part of that and you've got ideas <laughs> of, of really how to reach into our community, um, like, I love let, that. let me know, right? Because the goal yeah. is not, here's a new program. This is about how do we live missionally where we are. Like, you live in a neighborhood. 
you live in the neighborhood. I do. Do you know your neighbors, <laughs> right? I do don't. you have faith conversations, right? <laughs> yeah. So that yeah, kind of stuff. That's really cool. cool. I feel like I feel like not to be Captain Segway here, but like I feel like it, <laughs> it actually fits really well into what you talked about. You know, about like just the the idea that we were all created with this longing for like light, right? Mm-hmm. And for like there's something inside of us. Yeah. So ultimately, it's not like we're 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 offering something or presenting something that people aren't interested in. Yeah. Ultimately, we're all asking the same questions, right? right? And we're all longing for something that gives us purpose and hope. Well, and yeah, that, and I right? think everybody has experienced like the downside of the answers that right. don't give you that thing that you're looking yeah. for. Right. It's just like oh, I now like know I'm what empty. I don't want. <laughs> yeah. And, like we were created for this for sure. And so, if yeah. anything, like it's the most compassionate and loving thing you can do to help somebody. Yeah. Like, if if you see an old lady trying to like load up her, uh, you know, car with all her groceries, and she's got like some fifty pound bag in there, you'd be like, dude, you're you're a jerk for not helping her. <laughs> and so, in a lot of ways, like, oh, that's, you saw that? <laughs> you, I did. I can't believe you saw that. I did. I'm so embarrassed. Um, <laughs> but it's it's kind of the same thing though. It's like, man, like if we have this, like, I think it was Penn and Teller. Um, you know, they're mm-hmm. they're like magicians. Mm-hmm. They're also avowed atheists, mm-hmm. and they said, like Christians, like if you really believe this stuff, yeah, how much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them and mm-hmm. to not share? And I remember hearing that, and I was like, whoa, calling out the. Yeah. I know. He's like, if you really yeah. believe this, like you should be telling people. Wow. Yeah. But it, it goes beyond just telling, right? It's it's experiential. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. the reason Nicodemus was drawn to Jesus. It wasn't just the things that he said. Right. It was the things he did. Like this light was evident in the mm-hmm. way he lived. Yeah. And it was like when, when you live in darkness, you can't help but be drawn to light. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So if you're walking down the stairs at night and you know your power goes out, but you see a light source, you're like, I'm, I'm going to that. I don't know yeah. what it is. Probably mm-hmm. an sure. iPad or something. Yeah. So Yeah. I just love I, I love I, I love how you presented this. Um, I love the um, the, the bringing us back to the darkness. Because I think a lot of times this story is just taught in isolation. Mm-hmm. And that's why we get the idea, oh, De- oh, Nicodemus came in the shadow of the night and, and it was secretive and he was ashamed and all that stuff. But I mean, as we're going through the, the book of John, right? It's, it's like, oh, of course, like that makes sense. Like that he would, John is actually using that as something to... To, to tie everything in mm-hmm. again, right? And say it wasn't under the cover of like darkness like, like that he was ashamed. It was more that um, John making the point that there's darkness and there's light. Mm-hmm. And I love that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the hard thing too, I think, is sometimes living in the dark, it, it's a little more comfortable. Sure. Right? You yeah, know, like, it's your comf- you get yeah. comfortable there, for sure. That's when you can have a routine. Mm-hmm. You don't have to deal with things. Mm-hmm. And even for a lot of us who follow Jesus, like we, we have a proclivity to drift towards darkness. Yeah. Um, but what I love towards the end there is Jesus is going like, no, but you, you walk in the light. Like this is yeah. the thing you're being invited into. It's not this one and done, you're right. saved. It's like, no, this is an everyday thing. Yeah. Like we keep coming back. We keep making this decision. We keep setting our eyes on Jesus. Sure. And sometimes yeah. we'll stumble back a little bit and that's okay. As long as, you know, we kind of recenter yeah. and mm-hmm. get yeah. back in the light. I love like, Again, we've we've talked about how poetic John is, right? And like for me, I'm I'm definitely not that kind of thinker. And so <laughs> this is such a difficult book for me. You know, even reading the the ICB version, which is the International Children's Version, if you yeah, don't know yeah, right. that. Cool. Go yeah. with the comic book one. So <laughs> like even reading that piece of it to help give clarification is still a struggle. Like it's yeah. still so you guys are just really helping kind of un not unmask, but open it up to say like, this is what this is meaning. This is what he's doing, you know? And I love that you bring us into like, who Nicodemus is in this moment that (laughs) I'm like, he's a practical man, I can see, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Asking the questions of like, what does this mean to be born? You know, as simple as that, you know, like I can't go back, you know, like it's a practical question. Can you imagine like, if that's what we really had to do, yes. like, <laughs> Maley comes home from youth group one well, day and like, time. hey, mom, I'm a Christian now. I need to be born again. <laughs> Can you help me with that? I, I, You're no. like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but but just even that thought process when Jesus continues, like, I'm telling you the truth. This is how, like, how difficult it would be for him to have, you know, he's this, he's a scholar, right? Like, he's a, mm-hmm. you know, and to be like, I have to get over what I'm thinking to in order to believe, 
Yeah. You know. But, but what I love is like there was a compulsion that drove him to mm-hmm. Jesus. Yeah. Where he's sure. like, all right, so even with all of my struggle over here, even with my whole history and background, mm-hmm. like I, I still see something and I know I want it. Mm-hmm. And yes. I may not get it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move towards mm-hmm. it. And, and ask I, questions. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I honestly I think oh that's, my gosh. that's a yeah. big part of mm-hmm. faith right there. Like even for a lot of us, like I still encounter things that I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Right. Yeah. In the Bible. Or things in my relationship with Jesus where I'm like, this is hard. This right. is confusing. But the thing I always go back to is like, well, I know who Jesus is. And I know who I am. Mm-hmm. And I may not understand everything in the middle, mm-hmm. but I know what darkness is. And I've, I've experienced light. So I'm, I'm going to keep moving. Right. And I'm going to – like that, that's where trust and faith come yeah. in. Yeah. Man, I, 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 I gained so much more admiration for Nicodemus. In mm-hmm. this story, in this message, you know, just because I think for the first time I began to see his, like, like you pulled out, like his, the drive and what was behind, like his longing for the kingdom, like, but also it, within that though was an understanding like that it isn't really voiced, but it's an understanding of him feeling like I'm part of this system right now and it doesn't feel <laughs> like what it's supposed to be. Like you're talking about something different. So he comes with like a ton of questions, a ton of like Mm -hmm. curiosity and he just sits and listens. And, and, and the beauty of Jesus and the way that Jesus like tenderly interacts with him and says, um, speaks to Nicodemus in a language that Nicodemus understands. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I mean, just the way that you kind of unpacked all that for us, Nate, like was really eye opening for me and just really helped me to realize that, wait a second, I can totally identify with yeah. Nicodemus. Like I can totally get that when I see stuff or feel stuff or sense stuff that I'm just like, man, is this, is this what the kingdom is? You know, yeah. is this what we're, is this what it's all about? You know, and and I think I think I'd love your thoughts on this, but I feel like this story is one example of encouraging that. Yeah. Well, I I, I really do, right? Yeah. Because Jesus was never like, oh, you dummy. Blah blah blah. Right. No. I mean, th- th- there was yeah. a little rebuking that happened. I was like, "You're a teacher. Like, how do you how do you not see this?" <laughs> right. Which which is fine, but but I think more than anything, that was about humbling Nicodemus because he's coming out yeah. of this context that says we know it all. Right. We've got right. it all, and Jesus is going like, "But you've missed the whole mm-hmm. thing." Yeah. Right. And and yeah. even with that, there's that invitation. Yeah. Just come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you see that all throughout John. Come and see. Come and see. Yeah. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Like I, I was even thinking mm-hmm. about like Stetson's message from a few weeks ago uh, with that question that Jesus asked the disciples, like, what is it you seek? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he didn't even have to ask Nicodemus. He knew. No, right. And he's yeah. like, all right, well, this is what you want. This is how you get it. Yeah. Um, and there's something, I don't know, there's something just really beautiful about that for me. You know, even for a lot of us, we have probably been a part of church culture for a while. Right. A lot of us have gone to church for a while. And sometimes I think we're just as guilty as being like the Pharisees. For sure. sure. Yeah. Um, in the sense that we've got our rhythm, our routine, and if I just do this, that, yeah. and the other thing, I'll be good with God. And it's like, well, I don't know, like reading this story, reading what Jesus said, I kind of feel like, man, am I missing it? Mm-hmm. For sure. Like, what, what do I need to see? Yeah. And yeah. so it's like, okay, can I take that to Jesus and say, yeah. hey, what? And the thing is, and the thing is in in this passage, like there are so many like just pow type of verses, right? Mm -hmm. Like as far as just like the ones that we know, the the idea of being born again, man, we toss that phraseology around all the time, right? Right. But do I really have a clue? <laughs> like, like you and I are 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 Bible Bible school students. Like, do we really have a clue like what all that entails, Mm -hmm. right? When it when when you know, the banger of a verse, John three sixteen comes along and we're just, and Jesus like, finally, you can feel him just kind of like tiptoeing around and then finally says, he says like, listen. This is what it boils down God to. God so yeah. loved the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The world. Yeah. And I just, I can imagine like Nicodemus and he's like, whoa, what? But I thought God loved us. What now? Yeah, the <laughs> like, Jewish, the Jewish culture, us. right, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, and I like, I, I, I just, I think I want to, like approach this passage in this book just in a way that I'm just like, okay, I've heard these verses before, but I don't have it figured out. Right. You know? Yeah, and there's there's a humility. And and that's honestly, that's the heartbeat and the heart posture mm-hmm. of Nicodemus and yeah. going to Jesus. Right. A lot of times we look at him, oh, you're a coward, you're scared, you're this, you're that. It's like, no, he he was just an earnest seeker of truth. I love it. Yes. Um, and I love that 
in all the phrases coming back when Jesus replies, he says, I tell you the truth. Like yep. he opens mm. with that. And I think there is something just so comforting yeah. in that, you know, like I'm here to tell you the truth. That's good. Mm, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you for Thanks, this. Dave. And thank you, Michael. Yeah. So we Good hope job, you guys, Michael. yeah, great job. <laughs> we Good all job, did Jenny. a fabulous job. <laughs> hey guys, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week.